what God tells us um, and reminds us. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. This is uh, the day that the Lord hath made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I don't know about you, I'm glad to be back uh, again here in the sanctuary on another Sunday. I'm even more excited uh, of the weather forecast of 47 degrees today so we can, uh, so we can get some, some of this stuff melted. Uh, we certainly like to thank uh, Steve Hardorn and others who uh, made sure the parking lot uh, was taken care of this week so we could uh, uh, get in safely this morning. Uh, for those of you that are worshiping with us, joining with us on live stream, again, we'd like to welcome you to St. John's East. Uh, United Church of Christ, where in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus Christ himself said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You will see in the uh, front area this morning uh, are two altar candles, and they are lit, of course, to remind us of Jesus, who, again, is the light of the world, both human and divine. The single pillar candle uh, that is lit represents those of you that may be worshiping with us this morning online via live stream. Uh, we encourage you to light your own candle so that we can share this worship time together, together, excuse me, whether we're gathered here in the sanctuary, uh, in our homes, work, in our automobiles, or elsewhere. Uh, also, we will be um, having communion service uh, at the end of our worship experience. So for those, again, of you that are tuning in, uh, get your crackers or bread or grape juice and uh, so you can join in with us um, in communion a little later this morning. Let us begin our worship uh, knowing this one truth. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Good morning. I think there's a birthday person that came in the door. Is that right? Jeff? Happy birthday to you. It's your 60-ish, right? <laughs> I, you know, that's one bad or good thing about Facebook is you see things, right? And so you have to share. Um, so a couple of things. I hope you joined us online at the Ash Wednesday service. I enjoyed it tremendously, especially the music. Um, so mark on your calendar, April 2nd, Good Friday, we are going to have another online service at 6 p.m. So feel free to join us at that time as well. Um, bags are out in the narthex again, the Linton bags. I know last week we were expecting that wonderful st snow and we got it. It was awesome. I haven't been in school since a week ago Tuesday. <laughs> I'm sorry, Henry had to go in, but... Um, anyway, obviously I didn't even kind of push people to take bags with them because I knew what was going to happen, but there are names on the long table. There are staple names on the back that has the name, the address, and phone numbers. If you could take a couple and give them a call and say, I just have something from St. John's East and drop it off, that would be wonderful. The more we can get out, the easier it is for everybody. Um, if you are not a regular visitor attendee or member there are blank bags that are sitting um, by the sign-in table by the two chairs um, and they have nothing on the back so feel free to pick those up um, and then if you want to pick one up and share with a neighbor or a co-worker feel free to do that there's about five or so left out there for that so um, just kind of share the love there are also some extra share the love um, little cutouts and then there's four on a slot that you had in the bulletin last Sunday, feel free to pick those up on the table. Um, if you did not pick up communion cups on your way in, um, when it's time for communion, you might want to just kind of raise your hand or stand, and we'll try to make sure that you get one of those as well. So.
Would you join me in a word of prayer? Our Father and our God, we are so grateful, so thankful and appreciative on this another Sunday morning. You woke us up, you touched our eyelids with a finger of love, grace and mercy. And then God, um, as we woke up this morning, you gave us a, a heart and a, and a mind and a, a motivation to come to the house of prayer to give your name, praise, honor, and glory. Thank you, God, for all of your blessings, for all of your benefits. As we take a retrospective look back over this past week, um, especially in uh, light of the, the snow and the ice, um, there were some people that got stuck. Uh, unfortunately, some people were in automobile accidents. In spite of everything that went on, God, you, you guided us, you directed us, and certainly, God, you protected us. We express our appreciation even right now. And then, God, as we have experienced so many times before, everything that we go through in this life is temporary. Just a few days ago, um, schools were closed, and many people were having difficulty getting to work. But we rise on this Sunday morning, we looked at the Weather Channel, and we saw uh, a forecast of 47 degrees. The, the snow and the ice is melting. Uh, we're even looking at 50 degrees next week, guys. So even here in the month of February, um, you're taking care of us, God. And, and those changes are coming from a positive standpoint. Every individual, every family um, that is uh, with us today physically in the sanctuary or joining us via live stream, we pray special blessings on them even right now. Uh, blessings of uh, favor and, and health and love and restoration and healing. God, you know what our needs are better than we know how to articulate them. But right now, in the name of Jesus, and certainly in the power of his shed blood, we ask and we receive uh, blessings that we are not even able um, to receive each and every one of them. Now, be with us, God, as we go through this worship experience this morning, and even uh, when it is time for the word of God to come forth, we ask, God, that you speak to me and through me as I speak to the people and that we will leave here better than once we came. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. All that agreed said amen. amen. This morning's call to worship for the people. It's a very easy thing to repeat. For those of you that are with us online, open our eyes, Lord, will be your part. Lord, we come today seeking your presence and your healing love. Open our eyes, Lord. Release us from the blindness of indifference and self-importance. Open our eyes, Lord. Give us hearts and hands willing to reach out to people in need whenever we find them. Open our eyes, Lord. Give us courage to be of help to all your beloved children. Open our eyes, Lord.
As we continue our study of, or our focus on black history within the Christian community, I think we have an interesting connection this morning between the scripture of Luke 10 verses 25 through 37, the parable of the Good Samaritan, and you'll hear later about the Green Book. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he, but he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Thank you so much, Ginger, for sharing certainly one of my, uh, my favorite texts because it actually uh, puts ministry uh, into action. Uh, when you look at the parable of the Good Samaritan in modern day terms, there was a priest and a Levite. The priest would, if you will, recognize, uh, would be recognized today as a, as a preacher or a pastor. Um, the Levite, possibly a, a, a deacon or a religious leader. Sadly, both of those individuals, religious, if you will, saw the plight of that individual that had, be, had been beaten and robbed, both passed on the other side. The Samaritan, who actually uh, did not actually associate or affiliate with the Jews, was the one that got off his beast, uh, that bound up his wounds. And then he went that extra step, uh, he actually gave money. Uh, to the individual at the hotel, paid for that total stranger's fee, uh, and gave a little extra and said, on my way back, if he needs anything else, uh, think about how many of us would leave our credit card <laughs> for a total stranger, hey, anything he needs. So it really puts uh, ministry into action, and it challenges us, especially in these days and times, uh, to be more sensitive to who our neighbor is. I would encourage us with that in mind to think about uh, individuals, sure you've read or seen by now, uh, what's going on in Texas, uh, the struggles and the challenges uh, that they are going through. Uh, I know at Memorial this morning at the end of our worship, uh, Pastor Brooks gave a special appeal uh, as far as donations. So uh, as the Lord, Spirit of God may be leading you uh, to bless someone that is in need, uh, let us be encouraged to do so. Slight change to the program uh, before we bring up our readers this morning. Um, initially, when in our planning meeting, uh, we had said we would do an overview of the Green Book. And as I was looking over material this week, I saw something that I, I felt would give us a broader scope uh, on African-American or black history. I will take a moment, because uh, I don't want to ignore uh, that topic of the Green Book. Many of you have heard of it, some may have even seen the movie, but just a brief synopsis, uh, a gentleman by the name of Victor Green, an African-American uh, postal worker, 
uh, understood the plight of African Americans many, many years ago when they wanted to travel across the country, more specifically traveling from northern states to southern states. And the understanding, the clear understanding was there were specifically places that were not safe for Negroes as uh, they were called. As a matter of fact, if you Google it, it's actually called uh, the Negro Green Book Travel Guide. And I would, I would encourage you to look that up and see uh, some of the specificities of what um, African Americans had to go through so if you were traveling, if you will, as an example, from Evansville to Atlanta or from Newburgh to Mobile, Alabama, it was understood that there were restaurants you could not eat in. There were definitely hotels you could not spend the night in. There were uh, gas or filling stations, as we used to call them back in the day, that it was not safe for you to stop and get gas. And so what the Green Book did, it gave you specific locations as an alternative where it was safe. As a matter of fact, many times if you were taking a family trip down south and you looked at the route and you saw that there weren't places to eat uh, or sleep, what that meant was you would prepare enough food um, so you could eat all the way, however many hours that trip may be. It also meant many times to load up pillows and blankets because you would have to find a safe place on the side of the road uh, where you could sleep or spend the night. That also meant even times that you would have to gas up here in Evansville and carry extra gas with you so you could fill up on your own, not to mention literally uh, relieving yourself or using the restrooms uh, on the side of the road. It really uh, shows, um, as the old saying goes, we've come a long way, we've got a long way to go. So the Green Book, again, very interesting. Look into that more in detail at your own time. What I've asked our uh, uh, readers today to do is give us an overview. It's actually called uh, the Civil Rights Movement Timeline. It's going to start in 1948. It's going to take us all the way to 1968. So we're going to look at approximately a 20-year period and listen very closely to the dates, the times, the locations, and the specific situations and circumstances. And that's going to be shared with us this morning by some really good friends of mine. And that's uh, Sam and Christy Mormon, which I'll give them a hand as they come. Good morning. Good morning, sir. My wife and I are going to speak briefly about the Civil Rights Movement timeline. The Civil Rights Movement was an organized effort by black Americans to end racial discrimination and gain equal rights under the law. It began in the late 1940s and ended in the late 1960s. The movement was mostly nonviolent and resulted in laws to protect every American's constitutional rights, regardless of color, race, sex, or national origin. On July the 26th of 1948, President Harry Truman issued Executive Order 9981 to end segregation in the armed services. On May 17th of 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, a consolidation of five cases into one is decided by the Supreme Court, effectively ending racial discrimination in public schools. Many schools, however, remained segregated. On August the 28th of 1955, Emmett Till, a 14-year-old from Chicago, is brutally murdered in Mississippi for allegedly flirting with a white woman. This murder, uh, oh, his murderers are acquitted and the case brings 
international attention to the civil rights movement after Jet Magazine published a photo of Teal's beaten body at his open casket funeral. On December the 1st of 1955, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white man on a Montgomery, Alabama bus. Her defiant stance prompts a year-long Montgomery bus boycott. On January the 10th and 11th of 1957, 60 black pastors and civil rights leaders from several southern states, including Martin Luther King Jr., meet in Alabama, I'm sorry, Atlanta, Georgia, to coordinate nonviolent protest against racial discrimination and segregation. On September the 4th of 1957, nine black students known as the Little Rock Nine are blocked from integrating into Little Rock Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. President Dwight Eisenhower eventually sends troops to escort the students. However, they continue to be harassed. On September the 9th, 1957, Eisenhower signs in the Civil Rights Act of 1957 into law to help protect voters' rights. The law allows federal prosecution of those who suppress another's rights to vote. February 1st, 1960, four African-American college students in Greensboro, North Carolina refused to leave a Woolworths white-only white lunch counter without being served. The, Green, the Greensboro four, Enzo, Jr., or Enzo Blair Jr., David Richmond, Franklin McLean, and Joseph Neal were inspired by the nonviolent protest of Gandhi. The Greensboro sit-in, as it came to be called, sparked similar sit-ins throughout the city and other states. November 14, 1960, six-year-old Ruby Bridges is escorted by four armed federal marshals as she becomes the first student to integrate William France Elementary School in New Orleans. Her actions inspired Norman Rockwell's painting, The Problem We All Live With, 1964. 1961, throughout 1961, black and white activists known as Freedom Riders took bus trips through, for, through the American South to pro protest segregated bus terminals and attempted to use whites only restrooms and lunch counters. The Freedom Riders were marked by horrific violence from white protesters. They drew international attention to their cause. June 11th, 1963, Governor George C. Wallace stands in a doorway at the University of Alabama to block two black students from registering. The standoff continues until President John F. Kennedy sends the National Guard to the campus. On August 28, 1963, approximately 250,000 people take part in the march on Washington for jobs and freedom. Martin Luther King gives his I Have a Dream speech as the closing in the front of the Lincoln Memorial stating, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the truth meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. On September 15, 1963, a bomb at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama kills four young girls and injures several others prior to Sunday services. The bombing fuels angry protest. On July 2, 1964, the President Lyndon, John, Lyndon B. Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act of 1964 into law. Into law. The origin, Title VII, of, this, of the act establishes the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is EEOC, to help prevent workplace discrimination. On February 21, 1965, Black religious leaders Malcolm X is assassinated during a rally by members of the Nation of Islam. On March 7, 1965, Bloody Sunday in, Selma, in the Selma to Montgomery March, around 600 civil rights, marcher, several, civil rights marchers walked to Selma, Alabama to Montgomery, the state in the protest of black voter suppression. 
local police block the brutality and block and brutality attack them after successfully fighting in court for the right to march. Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders led two, two more marches finally to reach Montgomery on March 25th. August 6, 1965, the President signs the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to prevent the use of literacy tests as voting requirements. It is also federal examiners and also for federal examiners to review voters' qualifications and federal observers to monitor polling places. On April 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated on the balcony of his, ho his own hotel room in Memphis, Tennessee. James Earl Ray is convicted of the murder in 1969. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Christy. Great job. You're welcome. A lot of activities in that 20-year period between 1948 and 1968. I'd like to highlight one of the last ones that Christy read March 7th, 1965, that march from Selma to Montgomery. Does anybody know approximately uh, how far it was from Selma to Montgomery? Anybody want to take a guess? Approximately 45 miles. To put that in perspective, and y'all seen the video, y'all seen the pictures, King and arm in arm, 600 marchers, can you imagine having to walk from Evansville to Orangeboro in the hot sun. And if y'all notice Martin Luther King, he didn't wear tennis shoes and Nikes. Martin Luther King wore a suit and a tie, dress shoes, 45 mile march, not to mention water hoses, uh, dogs being attacked, et cetera, et cetera. So we remind ourselves of the commitment and the sacrifices. Uh, that many led that, uh, of course, have given us our rights today. Thanks again, Christy, Sam, uh, great job. Um, at this time, we would like to acknowledge our prayer concerns for the people and certainly any praise reports that anyone has. Um, coming from our booklet, continued prayers for Andy and Lisa um, as they go through cancer treatments. Uh, praise for a uh, praise report for a successful surgery for Brother Bob Hess and prayers for uh, rest before he begins to go through radiation. Uh, prayers for the family of Eric, and I'm not sure of that last name. Gurrier. Gurrier, thank you, uh, in the passing of their son. So we certainly want to keep that family lifted. Um, Brother Daryl Wiggins, who has been with us in the past out of Chicago, uh, we lifted him up last week in the passing of his mom. Uh, right now, because of his recent surgery, he's still recovering, but we've been texting one another. So let's keep Daryl uh, lifted up in prayer. We've already mentioned uh, the individuals, families, businesses, churches in the state of Texas. Um, we actually have a former memorial member by the name of Ty Prince, who has been out of power and all that type of thing. So. Um, this past week, when many of us were complaining about the snow and ice, there were people that didn't have heat, didn't have water, didn't have electricity. Um, so, hey, let's, uh, let's certainly count our blessings. Uh, we prayed for Sister Janet Johnson last week. And, um, man, those prayers were answered. Uh, Patty and I had received a call uh, earlier in the week uh, from um, Janet's daughter, uh, Deanna, and and they were actually talking about uh, making the decision to move Jan into hospice. And then just a few days ago, we uh, got another call, or actually, uh, Deanna went uh, live on Facebook, uh, praising and shouting and letting us know that that situation had turned around and uh, that her mom is certainly improving. So please keep Sister Janet Johnson on your prayer list. God can turn that thing around. Uh, my, uh, my friend and chess buddy, Willie Curry, I mentioned him last week. Um, he was in ICU, um, actually uh, close to death because of um, uh, 
COVID-19, and this is a young brother in his 40s, married, three young children, and another praise report moved uh, a few days ago out of ICU into a regular room, and then Thursday uh, was able uh, to go home. So again, we just, uh, man, we just thank God for um, these uh, extraordinary uh, healings. Uh, as we used to say back in the day, God can and God will. Any other prayer requests or praise reports uh, before we pray this morning? Anyone else? Steve? Tim Butler, yes, thank you so much. Brother uh, Tim Butler, we're praying for that family. Anyone else? Okay, I'm going to pray over these prayer requests and then we will pray the Lord's Prayer uh, together. Father, uh, you're an extraordinary God. You have all power in your hands. Even when things may look bleak um, from a, a health or even a recovery standpoint, uh, so often, God, you step in right on time as only you can do. So oftentimes, and we're appreciative of doctors, nurses, medicine, and technology, but ultimately, God, we realize it is you that is our healer. So God, thank you for taking care of friends and families and loved ones. Continued uh, guidance, direction, and protection for those families in the state of Texas. And then for those of us, God, who have some uh, minor challenges compared to some that have been mentioned today, let us not take basic fundamental blessings for granted. Shelter, food, transportation, the ability to interact with friends, family, and loved ones, even what we are doing right now, the opportunity to come together in fellowship with like-minded believers, reasonable portion of health and strength, little extra money in our pocket, the ability to go out to eat. Some things, God, that there are people right now praying, wishing, hoping they were in our shoes. So God, we, don't, we always want you to know that we don't take any of your blessings for granted. We continue to give your name, praise, honor, and glory, for indeed thou art worthy. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you join me this morning uh, in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
uh, like to um, add one other additional praise report. I uh, see my friend and fellow uh, church clerk, uh, Dorothy or Dottie Spalding, as we like to refer to her, uh, just a praise report um, on her mother, Alva Graves, who had been hospitalized recently. Uh, she has been released and um, is back in the nursing home. So uh, keep that name, Alva Graves, uh, on your prayer list as uh, uh, God continues to bless her with good health. Um, this morning, if you would, um, let's turn in the Old Testament to Isaiah chapter 25. Isaiah chapter 25. And uh, since we did a little bonus action on black history, we're going to do a little bonus action in the word Isaiah 25. Then we're going to look briefly at the Gospel of John chapter 4. So make y'all put in a little extra work this morning. Isaiah 25. We're just going to read one verse. O oh Lord, thou art my God, I will exalt thee, I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things, thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. That's Isaiah chapter 25, and now um, if you would go to the Gospel of John chapter 4. Give you just a moment to find that. We're going to read two verses, verses 23 and 24. Gospel of John, chapter 4, beginning our reading at verse 23. But the hour cometh, and this is Jesus speaking, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. With those verses being read this morning, we want to talk for just a few minutes on the power of worship. The power of worship. And uh, by now, you should already have your Bible or cell phone in your hand. So repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I am a believer, not a doubter. And my life is the better after having heard the word of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The power of worship. As I did my research for this message, I, I looked, of course, for a definition of the word worship, and I found several, but for the sake of our discussion this morning, here's the one I'd like to use. Biblical worship is acknowledging that God is the king and results in living lives in light of that truth. I'll repeat that. Biblical worship is acknowledging that God is king, God is Jesus is Lord, and results in living lives in light of that truth. As I was listening to Ginger read that scripture on the Good Samaritan, that's what I saw. An individual that didn't just claim to be religious or claim to be a Christian or claim to go to church, but he put in action what he really believed, which when you actually looked at that text, he was exhibiting love to someone that was in need. I believe certainly you and I should be doing the same. So one of the questions I'd like to ask everyone this morning to consider today is, is God your king? Is Jesus truly the Lord of your life? And if the answer to either or both of those questions is yes, then does your life and lifestyle reflect that? Many years ago in a Bible study that I attended, the question was asked, Steve, you'll remember this, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If you were put on trial tomorrow, Monday, you're in court, 
trial question was, you're a Christian, would there be enough evidence, and may I be even more specific, would there be enough tangible biblical evidence to convict you? And, and don't look for the easy way out. Yes, I go to church every Sunday. No, that's not enough to convict you of being a Christian. Just as many of y'all have heard, um, you come to church, which is a good thing, no more makes you a Christian than you standing in a garage makes you a car. There needs to be other specific things that would convict us this morning. And one other thing to think about before we dig deeper into this text, it's a beautiful thing to worship corporately like we are doing here this morning and for those of us that are worshiping with us via live stream. But I, I also believe personal worship yeah. is necessary and quite frankly should come prior to group or corporate worship. Man, I got to tell y'all, I, I enjoy uh, and appreciate wor worshiping with like-minded believers. It's nice to come in the lobby and hear people saying good morning and welcome. Uh, I called Joan Stoltz uh, yesterday because I hadn't seen her for the past three weeks. As y'all know, Joan, Joan's a regular and uh, Joan is friendly and she's outgoing and she makes you feel welcome in the church. So there's certain people, if they're not around, you miss them. And so uh, I was encouraged. In fact, it was funny uh, when I asked for Joan, Joan said, who is this calling? And I said, uh, I said, this is Brother John over at She said, oh, John, I didn't, I didn't recognize your voice. I thought I was a bill collector, so. No, no, just, just kidding. But the point is, it's good to fellowship with like-minded believers, but don't get it twisted. Before I come to church, every Sunday morning, I've already prayed. I've already praised God for his blessings and his benefit. I've already worshiped before I get to the sanctuary. So let's take a closer look at our verses for today, uh, starting there in Isaiah. O Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name. Thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels are of old, are what? Faithfulness and truth. And if you've been in relationship with God for any period of time, and many of y'all looking at me have been in relationship with God for years and even decades, you know that God is faithful. God is true to his word. We can learn something from the prophet Isaiah. He honored and he praised God because he realizes that God always completes his plans as promised. That's true, first of all, from a generic or an overall standpoint. As we read, study, continue to get a clearer, better understanding of the Bible, we find out that God is a keeper of his promises. He gives us various promises in a variety of categories, uh, salvation, help and guidance, faithfulness, wisdom, peace, love, joy, riches in heaven, strength and power. Okay, so that's overall from a generic standpoint, but check this out. On the personal or individual tip, God also fulfills his promises to you and to me. Right now, just for a moment, I want you to think of the prayers that he's already answered and continuing to answer for you and praise him for his goodness and his faithfulness. We have a reason to praise and to worship him. So next, let's look at the New Testament, fourth chapter of the Gospel of John. But the hour cometh, now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. The NIV says, for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. Verse 24 reads, God is a spirit, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The overall lesson here, of course, is that the worship of God is not to be confined to a single geographical location or necessarily regulated by the temporary provisions of Old Testament law. With the coming of Jesus Christ, the separation from the Jew and the Gentile no longer re relevant nor the centrality of the temple in worship. With the coming of Jesus Christ, all of God's children have now gained 
equal access to God through him. Even to my Catholic friends who uh, many times say you have to go through a priest or a pope or whatever. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says we have direct access. So worship becomes a matter of the heart, not external actions and directed by truth rather than ceremony. Y'all know we got to be careful about traditions and, and rituals and, and ceremonies. In the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Moses sets down for the Israelites how they are to love their God. You shall love the Lord thy God, how? With all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Our worship of God should be directed by our love for him. As we love, so we worship. Because the idea of might in the Hebrew indicates totality, Jesus expanded this expression to mind and strength. To worship God in spirit and in truth necessarily involves loving him with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. True worship must be in spirit. That is, engaging the whole heart. Lest there is a real passion for God, there is no worship in spirit. At the same time, worship must be in truth, that is, properly informed. Unless we have knowledge of the God we worship, there is no worship in truth. So both are necessary for God-honoring worship. Spirit without truth leads to a shallow overly emotional experience that could even be compared to a, a high on alcohol or a high on drugs. And you know what happens once the high comes down, it's all over with. So for many people in the church today, as soon as the emotion is over, as soon as the fervor cools, the worship ends. Truth without spirit can result in a dry, passionless encounter that can lead to a form joyless legalism. The best combination of both aspects of worship results in a joyous appreciation of God informed by scripture. So the more we know about God, the more we appreciate him. The more we appreciate, the deeper our worship. The deeper our worship, the more God is glorified. So as we look a little deeper into this topic of the power of worship this morning, let us consider. Number one, that worship requires both sacrifice and submission. I won't ask you to turn to it, but many of y'all are familiar in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 22, the story of Abraham and Isaac. When you look at the background of that text, all of those years, Abraham and his wife prayed for a son. God finally, even in their old age, blesses them, answers their prayers, and gives them Isaac. Then as a young lad, notice what God does or notice how he challenges Abraham. And listen to this challenge because if you haven't already, at some point God is going to challenge you and I in the same way. He comes to Abraham and says, Isaac, the son you love, and then watch this, your only son, he asked him to sacrifice him. And as I was reading that text from verse 2 to verse 3, you don't see anything about a pause. You don't see anything about an argument. Abraham doesn't go, well, don't you understand? He doesn't go through any of that. He starts packing up stuff to do exactly what God says. Man, I know, I know a lot of y'all ain't going to shout on it, but y'all familiar with that phrase, obedience is better than sacrifice. See, a lot of times we consider ourselves sacrificing certain things, but the truth is we're not being obedient to what God is asking us to do. Well, y'all know the rest of the story. They're packing up. They're, they're on their way up the mountain. And, man, I can just visualize in my own mind when young Isaac, says to his daddy, I see the altar, I, 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 I see the fire, where is the sacrifice? Man, man, y'all got to love Abraham. 
Y'all got to love Abraham. Abraham simply says that God will provide. Do y'all see the faith factor even early in the game? And see, the truth is, we read this story after the fact. We already know how it's going to work out. We can shout and get happy. Abraham didn't know how this situation was going to work out. But by faith, he's on his way up the mountain. He, as we wrap up the story, he wraps up his son, blindfolds him, literally puts him on the altar and raises the knife to slay his son. At that point, God stays his hand, points out the fact that there was a ram in the bush which he did sacrifice, and then Abraham named that place Jehovah Jireh. Somebody needs to understand, Jehovah Jireh simply means, plain language, don't go too deep on me, the Lord will provide. That brings me to a question as we worship and praise and serve God, active in ministry, what are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to submit unto God? We've already done a, a, a message on stewardship, time and talent and treasure and testimony, but we got to start asking ourselves on a personal tip if we're really, truly, and that's what the scripture says, that God is looking for the what? The true worshipers, not just people that wave their hands, shout and get happy, but after the benediction is over, what are you going to do the rest of the week like that good Samaritan? What are you going to do the rest of the week like Abraham if and when you are challenged? So understand that um, worship is, of course, a place of provision. And that's what God did for Abraham. The next thing we see as we look at the power of worship is worship invites the very presence of God. Psalm 16, verse 11 reads, Thou shalt, thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Um, now, when you're not sure which way to go, which way to turn, what to do about a particular situation or circumstance, uh, have you ever found yourself uh, at sometimes what uh, you and I would call a fork in the road and you don't know if you should go left or you don't know if you should go right. The good news is, according to this scripture, he will show you not just a path, but a path of life. And I'm being specific when I say path of life because you've heard this one, everything that looks good to you is not good for you. Uh, for, for some of y'all bling bling folk, all that glitters is not gold. Proverbs 14, 12 reads, There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Understand this morning that you can kill or be killed in a variety of ways. Kill a dream. Kill a relationship. Kill a career. Kill a friendship. Kill an opportunity. Sometimes the choices and the decisions we make, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, can even cause physical death. Uh, drinking too much alcohol becomes alcoholism. Use of drugs that may have started out just recreationally. All, all I wanted was just, a, was just a joint eventually ends in, a, in an overdose. Some of y'all sport fans out there uh, might remember the name Lynn Bias had just graduated from college, signed a contract with the Boston Celtics, already had his shoe contract done, and two days after he signs his professional contract, he and a few friends decided that they would get together and have a little, shall we say, celebration party that included drugs and Lenny Bias OD the same day, never spent any of the money from the shoe contract, never played one game uh, for Red Arback, Larry Bird, and the Celtics, all because of a life-changing decision. Uh, sometimes in involvement uh, with multiple sex partners ends up uh, meaning that you contract HIV and AIDS. I don't have to tell y'all the story about Magic Johnson. Y'all know how it went, top of his game. 
multiple NBA championships, had a, had a nice uh, girlfriend, getting ready to marry or whatever, but uh, was messing around at the Playboy Mansion and all that other stuff, and all of a sudden, HIV and AIDS. Now, the good news for Magic is he had the money to uh, get the nice uh, treatments and medications and all of that. But think about the thousands of others that weren't in Magic Johnson's position and the end thereof was death. But the worst possible death is eternal death. Separation from God. When a person physically dies and doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. As we keep reading in that text, we see in thy presence is fullness of joy. And there is a distinct difference, my brothers and sisters, between joy and happiness. Happiness is experienced based on outside influences, based on what's happening around me. I'm happy because I have family and friends. I'm I'm happy because I got a good job. I'm happy because I have a great career. I'm happy because I have material things, house, cars, clothes, money in the bank. I can afford to go on nice vacations. I get recognition from the community for my contributions. That makes me happy. But there's another reality. Everything I just listed, good list. It's all temporary. Uh -huh. There will come a time for each and every one of us that all of that stuff that I just mentioned, all of that stuff that makes us so happy will be no more. That's why, y'all know what we need? We need something down on the inside. That's the joy that the text is talking about, and that's one of the intangibles that knowing God and worshiping God can and will do for us. It gives us inner joy, inner peace, inner satisfaction, even though everything around me may be in chaos. Everything may be crumbling around me. We can still have joy. I can still hear the song, this joy I have, the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. The rest of that scripture says, at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Knowing God and worshiping God positions us to realize that we can and will experience, yes, many of earth's temporary pleasures. Jesus Christ himself said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And we can also have the promise and the eternal expectation that when life as we know it here on planet earth is all over, that we have a home in glory, a mansion in the heavens not made by hands. We have a reason to worship him. Thirdly, y'all know what worship will do? We're talking about the power of worship. Worship shifts your focus. Uh, if you look at uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the B clause, it says, For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Worship, if, if you let it, It'll shift your focus. Uh, another way to say it is worship helps us to keep things in what I like to call proper spiritual perspective. Uh, must believe that he is. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So here's a question. How many people believe that God is who he says he is? Y'all know I did a little research. Y'all know I Googled and, and, and looked at some numbers. Here's, here's what I found out. In 2009, according to this particular study, approximately 2% of the American population said that they didn't even believe in the existence of God. Ten years later, 2019, guess what? That 2% doubled to 4%. That means over 13 million people in these United States of America says that they don't believe in the existence of God. So that's just the atheists. I'm not even talking about the agnostics. So here we go. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Next, the text says that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. To me, that can mean a number of things such as accepting Christ as your personal savior, making a commitment to grow in grace, knowledge, and stature, which would include 
regular church attendance, involvement in ministry, being a good steward, time, talent, treasure, living a lifestyle that's pleasing to God, and how we, you and I, the Samaritan, treat our fellow man. Well, I don't know about you, but when I look around at today's society, I see a very small percentage of the things I just mentioned. Things that reflect that people are diligently seeking to worship, praise, follow, obey, and please God. I observe them doing a whole lot of other things because they believe, they feel, and or believe they will be rewarded for their efforts and their actions. Things that will reward them financially, career-wise, personal relationships, material uh, rewards, political affiliations, groups, clubs, fraternities and sororities, sporting events, NFL and NBA championships, scoring titles, MVPs, the list goes on and on. But how many of those same individuals believe that God will reward them both temporal as well and give them temporal as well as eternal rewards? So when we truly worship God, we don't want to uh, overlook or eliminate many of the worldly goals, aspirations that we have. That, those are good things. But we do need to balance our perspective and make sure we are also committing a certain amount of our time, our talent, our treasure, our efforts, and our activities in kingdom building. The things that will not only reward us in this life, but also will reward us in the life to come. The fourth area is your worship is also your warfare. And I hadn't really thought about this one until I really started digging. Uh, you've heard me uh, discuss in previous messages from this pulpit about the concept of spiritual warfare. Of course, Ephesians 6.12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Many of y'all looking at me this morning, you, you experienced this. If you're around the church, even as a child, you are familiar with the biblical account of Joshua and the walls of Jericho. Well, guess what? Israel won that battle of Jericho, not with weapons, but by worship. So let, so let me set the scene for us. The nation of Israel, they're at the end of their Exodus wanderings. They've been in the wilderness over 40 years. The adult generation, and y'all, I wish I had time to really dig into this part. The adult generation that initially fled Egypt has perished after 40 years in the wilderness. And there's a, there's a whole nother sermon right there. Being hard-headed, being stiff-necked, being disobedient, God allowed them to make a trip that should have taken three to four weeks. It took four decades, but there was a method to God's madness, if you will. He let them old heads, them stiff-necked, disobedient adults die out. They, they weren't going to make it to the promised land. So now their children and their grandchildren are ready to take the land and the promise that was given to their forefathers, God himself threw open the door to the promised land, holding back the flood waters of the Jordan River and leading the people across on dry land. See, a lot of people shout about uh, God opening up the Red Sea. You need to understand there's been other openings right here with in the book of, uh, in the book of Exodus uh, where he splits the Jordan River. So now they're ready. Only one thing is standing in their way, Jericho. When God gives Joshua his marching orders, the Lord leaves no doubt that he is the one giving them the city. Jericho and all the land belong to the Lord. He and he alone has the ability to grant it to his people. So God's instructions to Joshua don't have anything to do with besieging or attacking the city. God tells them they will take the city through worship. God tells Joshua to gather the people, march around the city once each day for seven days. The priests are to lead the procession with the ark, a visible symbol of the Lord's presence with them. Seven priests, seven trumpets are to go before the ark on the seventh day. 
they are to march around the city seven times. Then the priests will blow the trumpets, the people will shout, and the walls will fall. We used to sing this song as children. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. That's not warfare, ladies and gentlemen. That's not warfare, brothers and sisters. That's worship. So here's the bottom line, uh, both of these passages of Scripture. The warfare, whether it's on the inside or the outside, is defeated by the way of worship. And that's not the only time in Scripture that we see worship uh, active in warfare. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, it tells us how King Jehoshaphat led the people of Judah into battle with singing. As the people worshiped God, their enemies started fighting among themselves and destroyed one another. Acts 19, some of y'all remember this one how Paul and Silas were thrown in jail in Philippi. And that night, Paul and Silas all wrapped up, tied up in, in stocks and bonds. Y'all know what they started doing? They started singing praises. They started worshiping God in the jail. And y'all know how we do. When we get in a bad situation, we start whining. We start moaning. We start complaining. We start pointing fingers. Uh -uh. Paul and Silas gives us a good example. They started praising and worshiping, and guess what God did? Man, God sent an earthquake, the prison doors flung open, Paul and Silas was free, but here's the icing on the cake. The jailer got saved in the process. Somebody ought to say amen. Man, God is moving up in here. When you and I face our Jerichos, our places of battle, sometimes, I know it, me too, we're tempted to fight the war with the world's weapons. Y'all know what we do. We resort to manipulation and gossip and deceit. We, we grasp for power. We, we jostle for position, prepared to fight for our seat at the table. But these, my friends, are not the weapons that God gives us for our battles. You understand we have an enemy, Satan, and the spiritual forces of darkness that stand in opposition to God and his people. I assure you this morning, we cannot win the battle fighting on the devil's terms. God gives us a different set of weapons to use. Hear me now. Prayer, testimony, worship, the word of God, and the precious blood of Jesus Christ by which, somebody ought to say amen, we already have the victory. We can't win the battles the world's way. We win by following God's battle plan, we win by living out radical worship. What are the challenges set before you this week? We all have some. What battles are you currently facing? Know that our God has already given you the victory. A victory not won in a battle, but a victory won over 2,000 years ago on a cross. Stand in obedience on the truth of his word. Bathe your battle in prayer. Read and listen to stories of victory and move forward in worship. Then look to see what God will do, for God certainly is faithful. So what did we learn this morning regarding the power of worship, that worship requires, Abraham, sacrifice and submission. We learned this morning that worship invites the very presence of God. We learned this morning that worship will, if you'll allow it, it will shift your focus and your priorities. And last but not least, we learned this morning that worship is your warfare, but the great news is we already have the victory. As we prepare to close this particular worship experience, there may be someone in the sanctuary, there may be someone listening via live stream that wants to be on this, uh, I call it, the winning team of Christianity. You're, you're, you're tired of living a, an unfulfilled life and you're, you're ready now uh, to make a change. Maybe you've been attending a church and or participating in 
religious rituals and activities, but still something seems to be missing in your life. Well, I got great news for you. You can make that change today. You've heard me say it before, but it bears repeating that God loves you and has a wonderful, phenomenal, extraordinary plan for your life. Simply by committing your life to God, by accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Brother John, I'm, uh, I'm on my laptop, I'm, uh, I'm on my uh, telephone, and I'm, and, and I'm hearing you talking about worship, I'm hearing you talk about God, I'm hearing you talking about making a commitment of my life. What's my next step? What do I do? It's very, very simple, my brother and my sister. Tell God that you're sorry for your sins. That means acknowledging the fact that you are a sinner. Y'all know what the scripture says, all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. But it's a matter of admitting. It's a matter of acknowledging and then saying to God, based on how your Holy Spirit is leading, guiding, directing, and even convicting me right now, I realize that I need you in my life. I need you as my Savior. I'm sorry for my sins. I'm willing to commit my life to you even right now. My brother and my sister, if you've made that commitment today, welcome to the family of God. And then find you a place. St. John's a great place. We got some nice people here. We got some good Samaritans up in here. We got some really friendly folk, both black and white, that you can fellowship with. But St. John's not the only church in town. There's plenty of great churches, but find you a place where you can rub shoulders with, not just touch elbows with, but that you can interact, dialogue, fellowship, work, serve, and minister with, uh, with other like-minded believers. And then, as my pastor says, God will assist you to grow in grace, knowledge, and stature. Can we uh, give God a hand clap of praise for the word of God? As we um, prepare um, for communion, this morning, does everyone uh, have a cup? What I'm going to do first is pray over our offering, uh, thanking God for resources. And as we uh, look to give back a portion, we will, uh, of course, do our uh, communion. And then uh, I'll come back and do the benediction. Father God, we're grateful for the word of God. We're grateful for the fact that you reminded us that there is power in worship. Uh, when we cannot physically or mentally or emotionally fight certain battles in our lives, if we'll set aside the time, if we'll make the time, and make you a priority, worship and praise you, you'll open those doors that seem to be closed. You will make the impossible possible. So God, we give your name, praise, honor, and glory. And at this particular time, God, we thank you for resources. We thank you for income. We thank you for jobs and careers. We thank you for retirement and investments and social security and disability income. However, God, you have blessed us with, we simply pause now to bring back and give you a portion of what you have already blessed us with. Bless sanctify, multiply these gifts as they go for the ongoing as well as the upbuilding of thy kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night uh, that Jesus Christ was betrayed, uh, he took bread said, this is my body, um, which was broken for you. He also took the cup and said, this is my blood that was sacrificed for you. Think about what the word of God says. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. You, you can't go to church enough. You can't put in a, enough money. You can't sing enough. You can't work, earn your way into glory, into heaven. The Bible says there's only one way. I am the way, 
the truth, and the life. I was actually discouraged earlier this week. My brother Steve sent me a, sent me a, can't remember, an email, something on Facebook. One of my favorite comedians, Steve Harvey, seemingly, and I'm, I'm still studying it, I'm still researching it, talking about and actually promoting that there are multiple ways to get to heaven. It's a scary situation. But when we study scripture, we find from a prophetic standpoint that God says in the final days that people will have itching ears. In other words, they will want to listen to what sounds good to them, but not necessarily what the truth of the word of God is. That brings me back to, to this communion celebration. As often as we do this, we do it in remembrance of him. And that very scripture says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no woman, no boy, no girl gets unto the Father but by me. I love you, Steve Harvey, but that's not what the word of God says. Those of y'all listening to me this morning, as we symbolically, Think in terms of all the blessings and benefits that God has bestowed upon us our entire life. The greatest blessing still at the top of the list is when he died on Calvary over 2,000 years ago, shed his precious blood that paid the price of our sins. And watch this triple threat on the sin. All your sins in the past, all the sins that you're committing in the present right now, and for those of y'all, even though you won't admit it, the sins you are going to commit in the future, the shed blood of Jesus Christ pays. How do, how's it go? Y'all know when, it gets, when they stamp it, paid in full. Ain't you glad? If you're not, you ought to be glad that Jesus Christ died and paid the price for our sins. Right now, if you will take your bread, it looks cute, looks nice, it's a nice little circle, but don't ever forget, Jesus Christ's body was beaten beyond recognition. By his stripes, we are healed. Let us partake. Then when we think about the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, my brother likes to sing his song, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. One more time. I know it was the blood for who? For me. And, and all the millions, dare I say, all the billions of individuals that have lived on planet Earth, God thought enough of you, of me individually, that he would shed his precious blood I know it was the blood for me. Let us partake. God, we thank you, we praise you, and we love you. You've been good, kind, gracious, patient, long-suffering, understanding, forgiving toward each and every one of us. We will pause, God, a minimum of once a month to tell you that we don't take your blessings for granted. We understand and realize the great sacrifice that you made for each and every one of us. And because of what you did, in some small way, God, we will worship, praise, give your name, honor and glory. God, we understand the power of worship, that when we worship you, when we praise you, everything else, it's going to be all right. Thank you, God, for your broken body. Thank you for the shed blood. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. All that agreed said amen. amen.
I certainly want Jesus to walk with me. Thank you so much, Brother Henry. Thank you all for uh, coming out today. Um, again, we want to thank our, our friend and sister Gwen Lewis uh, for uh, being so gracious and uh, providing us with some special uh, black, black history gifts, sanitizers, bookmarks. Uh, very nice, very appropriate, and we uh, so appreciate those extra efforts. Um, thank you all again for coming out today. We look forward to a warm and uh, more comfortable Sunday next week. Uh, may we stand. God, as we um, leave this place, but never from your care, thank you, God, for leading, guiding, directing, and protecting us, God. Thanking you for giving us a, a better, a clearer understanding of the reason that we worship and praise you. Uh, not only, God, for what you've done in the past, but how you're blessing us right now. God, how you will continue to bless us in the future. Every individual, every family that is represented here this morning, God, we pray a special blessing of favor and uh, encouragement and good health and good fellowship. Uh, let us be like that good Samaritan and ask the question, who is my neighbor? And then when we understand the reality that at some point in time, we all have needed somebody to come to our rescue. We've needed somebody to give us a hug. We've needed somebody to give us a word of encouragement. We needed somebody to bind up our wounds, to pay our bill in advance. And so God, because you've done that on our behalf for us, God, we are going to reciprocate and do that for someone else. As we leave this place, God, but never from your care, let the words of my mouth the very meditation of our hearts. God, let them be acceptable in thy sight. You are our strength. God knows you are our redeemer. It is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and soon coming King that we pray. All that agreed said amen. amen. And thank God. Have a blessed week.